All right, fellas, today my conversation is with uh, Brad Pedersen, who I want to give gratitude to Renee Warren um, for connecting us. Uh, I know that Brad is connected to and is, has kind of experienced life with some of my dear friends, uh, Dan Martell being one of them. And also, I think Chandler Bolt, if I'm not mistaken, you might have spent a little time with Chandler. Uh, 100%, he, yeah, he's down yeah. here in Austin with me. Um, so, Brad, I'm I'm really thrilled to introduce you to the guys. And something I didn't tell you when we were warming up, you know, kind of behind the scenes in the green room, if you will, was that I when I saw an ad for Lomi, which for everybody who doesn't know what that is, it's this uh, this composter that goes in your kitchen, beautifully designed, and it's an indoor composter. And we compost most of our stuff outside. I saw this and I initially, I was like, this is genius. This is one of the most beautifully designed, amazing products. So when Renee had said, hey, you might want to meet my friend Brad. He's like this amazing father and incredible businessman. And I looked you up. I went directly to your site and I saw you with the machine. I'm like, hell yes, I want to talk to Brad. <laughs> this, is, this is divine. I, of course, want to mm. talk with Brad. But then when you dig in, um, it's like Christmas morning, Brad, and I say that intentionally, of course, but it is like Christmas morning with you because there just seems to be like this surprise and delight element of your life. The one element that I was delighted to hear about was um, your role as a father. And I loved learning about some of the things, especially in some of the interviews that I listened to you talk about. Uh, how you pursued education and learning and personal growth and how you turned your car into this podcast, audio book, you know, studio, and you would listen with your kids. And now you've got two kids that are in their twenties. So I want to acknowledge you for that. Um, I also want to acknowledge and, and share with everybody that, you know, the, the bios for my guests are oftentimes very long and exciting. These are entrepreneurs, often business owners, uh, investors, Brad is all of those things. And so that there is a little bit to the timeline here and, and what Brad has been out there doing in the world, he founded and scaled one of Canada's top uh, toy companies. And this started, I guess, in 2008. If I'm wrong about any of these dates or any of this timeline, Brad, correct me. Uh, it was called Tech for Kids. And then subsequently it merged with uh, and to create a company called Basic Fun which is a maker of some of the world's most iconic toys. Um, and uh, he left the toy business in 2018, and he co-founded a company called Pella, creating a new category of sustainable, smart device, protective covers, and other things, now that I've looked at that company, uh, which grew to over $100 million in revenue. I throw out some of these numbers because why I like to brag about these big figures and these big companies that guys like you create, Brad, is because it makes the fact that you're a dad even more impressive <laughs> because it's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, there's a lot to juggle there uh, when you've got, when you've got, uh, when you've got a family. Um, Pella uh, also launched the product that I referred to earlier, Lomi, or I shouldn't, I, I guess Pella, is Pe did Pella launch that? Is that safe to say? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about it later if you want. It, it was, we we're kind of solving our own problem, but yes, that was yeah. the company behind But it. had a huge crowdfunding uh, campaign, um, almost 10 million uh, for Lomi, Correct. which is this waste, waste kitchen composter uh, device, which again, we could talk about all this stuff. And then what ultimately uh, I think it led to this connection and this introduction was your new book, Startup Santa, A Toy Maker's Tale of 10 Business Lessons Learned from Timeless Toys. Um, so dude, let's just talk about life, family, business, all the things, and whatever the heck comes up for you today that you wanna just talk about. <laughs> you lead me, I'll lead you, let's just have a fun conversation. But there is there is a lot to talk about, including, and what I wanna begin with, Brad, is this idea of, reinvention. And mm. I shared this with you because when I was learning about you and I was learning about your your life, it just felt like you kept reinventing yourself because there's even some tales that aren't so spectacular in there, mm. if you would, you know, the messy stuff, um, you know, where things didn't go well. So I don't know what the right question is to ask around this, but what it feels like to me, Brad, is 
can you take me to a time in your life? Well, when I say the word reinvention, it's the one that pops to you or say, man, I reinvented myself many times, but this time felt like one of the biggest reinventions. <laughs> yeah. That's a fair question. That's a fair question. I agree. And to be fair, uh, there's been several reinventions. And I think that's a part of our journey as, yeah. as humans is that we're supposed to be constantly iterating and morphing and taking our life lessons and applying them to, uh, to embetterment, to become the best and brightest versions of ourselves. You know, what happens in your life is not there to define you. It's actually there to refine you. And so, you know, somebody asked me the other day, Brad, what's, what's your superpower? Um, and I said, I literally am just too stupid to quit. Like I, I have failed forward as a person. Um, and you know, I'm a, I actually delineate between what's failing and what's a failure, you know, failing is a part of succeeding. We need to make mistakes. We have to, that's the only way we really learn. Quite frankly, we success is a sucky teacher. You don't learn a lot from success. It's only when you fail that you're forced to stop, reflect, hopefully unpack the lessons and then try again. Uh, becoming a failure is when you get knocked down and you decide to stay down. So to answer your question about, you know, defining moment, uh, I'm going to say it was, uh, July, 2008. <laughs> and the reason that was so poignant is that, uh, I had just come through a, uh, a bankruptcy. Well, actually they call it restructuring, but I've come to learn that restructuring is a fancy word for bankruptcy. And that's because my first business I built, which I started back in 1996, which I scaled very quickly, went kind of from you know my basement uh, townhouse to become the largest toy distributor of our kind in the country. Um, we found out the hard way, you can grow too quickly, which I didn't know was a thing. I thought as an entrepreneur, you're supposed to just grow and you are supposed to grow, but you have to grow responsibly and you have to make sure you have the right resources to back that growth. But I found out you can get upside down on your bank covenants. And when that happens, they put you in the penalty box called special loans. And when you're in special loans, it's kind of a slow death. They just turn off the tap of cash. They give you just enough to basically exist. You're just, you know, very, very slowly dying. Um, and in order to get through that, that scenario, we had to go get new investment. And the only way they would invest in the company is if we would restructure it. So they could put fresh capital in, replenish the balance sheet, get rid of old liabilities and start again. So I'd had that happen in 2006. Fast forward 2008, we had all this fresh capital, we had a new business plan, and I thought this was going to be the solution. And two years into that, or almost two years into that, I found out that I was just repeating the same mistakes. Mm. And things went from bad to worse. And all the money that had come in actually was now depleted. And in fact, our losses were even more severe <laughs> than before the original restructuring. So that was an incredibly difficult time because at the same time, you know, I have young kids, you know, my kids today are 25, 27. So you go back and they're in their, you know, early teens at that time. And, you know, we're trying to, um, you know, uh, to make a life as a family, this business is pulling incredibly stressful in my life. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, personal guarantees for the loans. Um, you know, the bank has already tried to come and repossess the house once. So there's an incredible amount of stress going on. And I'm forced to try and figure out how do I turn this thing around? How do I solve this problem that just seemed too great to solve at that time? So that was an incredible moment of reinvention. Uh, but here's, here's what I've come to learn and understand about that time. If you ask somebody what they want, it often is just too big. It's too broad a question. And so when I was thinking about, okay, what kind of business do I want to create? If I'm going to go forward with this, what kind of business do I want to create? Um, I found that I couldn't get to that answer quickly. So I did the reverse of that. Well, what don't I want anymore? And I did reverse anti-goals. And it was really clear for me, here's the things in my life I don't want to have happen anymore. And I created a list of five, 10 things. And you know, kind of unconsciously, that became the basis of building a better business plan going forward, just by here's what I don't want to do anymore. So here are the baseline of what we we do. And I put that business plan forward to... Um, at that time, my board and the investors who had come in around the first investment back in 2006, uh, they reluctantly agreed to it. Of course, you know, usually good money doesn't follow bad. They typically cut their losses and move on, but they reluctantly agreed to it. Uh, I got a million dollar loan 
with 24% interest. That's a very sobering number, by the way. I mean, they wow. talk about high interest rates today, but that was very sobering. Plus personal guarantees and your house <laughs> all on the line. Wow. And we got a chance to start again. It was a reinvention of taking what I'd learned from the past, what I don't want anymore from that past, putting it into a new future. And uh, a year after that, uh, we successfully repaid that loan with interest uh, because we were forced to, to start again. And by the way, from the time the money hit our accounts, two weeks later, the Great Recession happened. And I think about that very consciously, knowing that I believe in divine intervention. And this was a point in my life where some higher power allowed all the paperwork to flow through and the money to land in our accounts literally two weeks before there would have been no more money. The entire world dried up after that. And that's the thin threads that allowed that even to be possible. Wow. What didn't you want? What was on that list? What? <laughs> so I'll, I'll go from the top. We were a Canadian distributor. So we were focused on Canada. I said, I don't longer want to be just focused on Canada. I want to be focused on international. We were a distributor, meaning that we were selling other people's products. I didn't want to do that anymore either. I wanted to control my own destiny and create my own content, my own IP, my own things. Um, we, as a distributor, had warehouses full of inventory, often millions of dollars. And, you know, inventory that sits a long time ages and becomes obs obsolete. So that's a problem too. And that becomes expensive. So I didn't want to have warehouses anymore. Um, employees, I had a whole lot of those. I wanted to, I knew you had to have a team, but I wanted to have a very, instead of having a battalion, I wanted a SEAL team. I wanted to really select people who could be very strategic in how they execute and be effective. Um, and I didn't, I knew it was going to be really hard to build a brand. So I decided that what I would do instead is focus on leveraging other people's brands to my advantage. So I went into the world of licensing, went to the Disney's, the Nickelodeon's, the Cartoon Networks at the time, and just use their IP to get the flywheel spinning for this new opportunity versus trying to build a brand from start, which is really, really difficult. So those are kind of the baseline principles that we applied. And that really became the formation and the foundation of how we then built Tech for Kids. How did you keep your head in the game during the reinvention? In what ways did you rejuvenate yourself? Uh, you know, in what ways did you care for yourself? How how did you how did you give yourself the space and the energy to have those creative, new, innovative thoughts? You know, th this is an interesting question because everybody thinks that there's some kind of silver bullet or magic skill or secret sauce to to doing this and i tell you it's as simple as just keep moving yeah. don't stop just one foot in front of the other um you know the um <laughs> so my mantra became proverbs three five and six which says trust in the lord uh lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will guide your paths and I've come to appreciate that it's actually is synonymous with the serenity prayer, which is, you know, Lord, grant me the um, uh, serenity to accept things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And the idea that there's things you can control, and there's only four things I've discovered you can control, uh, which is what you think, what you say what you choose to feel, what you ultimately land on, and then what you do with it. And those are the only four things you can control. And that is your circle of control on this entire planet. And then there's a circle of influence that you create from what you can control that you try and cascade. But the bigger part is the circle of concern. And that's God's circle. That's, you know, there's so much going on. I mean, we're spinning around the, the sun at 16,000 miles per hour. That's completely out of our control, right? Um, you know, what, the sun coming up, the the sun setting again that is all in a larger sphere that's beyond our control so when you realize that relative to the circle of 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 concern yours is just a very small part just consistently show up and do those things consistently and i just remember i'd be like well i'm going to get up this morning i'm going to go through my routine i'm going to go to the gym keep my fitness uh, as best as I can, because you can't give what you don't have. And if you don't have fitness and vitality, you can't actually, you know, do anything meaningful for that. I have to be uh, invested in my family because obviously, you know, that's the most important part of my life. If you don't have a family, um, you don't have those relationships with your kids, then you have nothing at the end, right? Most, most, most people sacrifice their wealth to or their health to accumulate their wealth and yes. in the process, lose their families and get to the end of their life and realize that they would use all their wealth to regain their health and their families. So 
I, I just knew after spending a bunch of time as an entrepreneur who was into personal development that that's something I never, ever wanted to do. I didn't want to make that mistake. Yes. And so it was, again, just do what you can do to control the things you can control and do it to the best of your ability. And that's it. As a dad, you know, my guess is that you you watched your kids reinvent themselves all the time. You know, I, I remember as a kid reinventing myself all the time, going through what was a break dancing phase at one point, and then, you know, it's on to... <laughs> on to the next thing and it's just me testing out what feels like me and and what i want to do i'm a karate guy i'm a skateboarder i'm a break dancer i'm a you know it's all these things and and i'm watching my son who's 14 now he just redid his whole room and he he's reinventing himself and hmm. and uh it's fun for me to watch and it's also fun for me to imagine what he's trying to experience on the inside, but what he's changing on the outside in his in his room. I'm wondering what you witnessed in your kids as they were reinventing themselves and and perhaps a reflection on your role in that. Did you encourage that? Did you did, do you remember or recall those seasons of their reinvention and how you approach that as a father? Yeah, look, um, as as I mentioned, my kids are in their mid-20s at this point. Um, if if I'm honest about how I operated when I was in the mud, the blood, and the flood of my business, um, I was a terrible dad um, simply by, you know, I would show up with my time, but not my attention. And it's a small nuance, but you have to have both. If you really want to yeah. uh, be a present in someone's life, it requires your presence and attention. So I, um, I am very grateful, you know, the luckiest thing that ever happened to me is meeting my life partner, my wife, Kelly, um, who, you know, quite frankly, <laughs> I, I joke that, you know, when, when we started going through, when, when the bank came to, to repossess the house, I'm pretty sure in her mind, she said, you know, what? I married him for better or worse, but not for this crap. Um, <laughs> but somehow she stuck around mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, it sounds trite to say it, but she was one of those people that she just didn't push away from the pain. She actually leaned into it and she knew that she had to step in and play a greater role, particularly during that time of crisis. Um, and so, you know, I, I tell people my badge of dishonor was my frequent flyer number because I was on a jet more than half a year mm. um, traveling around the world, trying to get things done, trying to make deals done, trying to save the company. In fact, I wasn't even thinking about abundance. I was just thinking about getting out of scarcity. Like I just got back to break even, right? Um, so what I, I say to say all that, that I've been very fortunate that because of the consistency of my wife um, and her edification of me, as a provider and somebody who was trying to really do what was in the best interest of our family, I was given the opportunity to rebuild a relationship with my kids, albeit later, like in their late teens is when, you know, I started to be present. Basically, when I started to pull out of the toy business, I was suddenly like, wow, if I don't invest in these relationships more intentionally versus like, you know, trying to allocate a few things here and there and almost contriving opportunities to, uh, create uh, meaningful memories together, um, I'm going to lose them. And, uh, you know, it, it was actually my daughter uh, and I had a, a, bit, a bit of a heated debate. Um, she was doing something with some friends and, you know, I, quite frankly, I've always been into personal development, reading books, listening to podcasts, going to seminars. It's always been a part of my, my ethos. And so I, I just knew that there was something I could tell her that would benefit her by explaining it through a book. And so I started leaning in and she just blew up and said, dad, this is another example where I'll never be good enough for you. And she burst into tears and ran out of the room. And I was just stunned because it kind of landed on me that I'm going to lose my kids. Like this, this is, this is the, you know, I'm seeing what is manifesting as reaping what I've sown over many, many years. And, um, that was a really, uh, I would say, a, a TSN turning point. I guess you guys have ESPN in the States, but we call it TSN up here in Canada, where we, it really got me clear on that this is something I got to change and lean into in a more meaningful way. And I'm happy to say, you know, um, I literally just got off a cat skiing trip with both my kids here yesterday. Um, and we go out of our, our way every year to invest time, first and foremost, in booking uh, uh, experiences where we will continue to make magic memories together as a family. 
understanding that that is the most important thing that I'm going to, when I'm laying on my deathbed, I'm not going to be thinking about the, the next deal I did. I'm going to be thinking about that time that we connected in a meaningful way. And I was able to invest myself into them and vice versa, because they are arrows in my quiver that I'm flying into a future that I'll never see. And I have the ability to impact generations to come through the way that I show up and invest into them. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it gives you a sense of kind of my, my past, which is less than perfect. As I said, a series of happy accidents and I failed forward to where I am today, where I figured a few things out. And I can also say that my relationship with my kids today is the best it's ever been. And I'm excited to see where the future takes us. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Brad. I really feel your heart when you tell those stories. And I, I love that I just get the full version of it. You know, the, the painful parts and the parts that, you know, that, uh, that you're proud of now. Um, that's really cool. You know, I'm interviewing a guy named Jason Gaddis soon. He has a company called the relationship school and he talks about, I've uh, been studying his work, preparing for this interview and he talks about repair uh, he's not mm. the only therapist, of course, to talk about repair. This is, this is, I think, the common thread amongst great therapists that I uh, appreciate and that they'll say something to the effect of it's not, it's not whether or not there's a breakdown. Um, that's inevitable uh, that you have those. It's like, how do you repair? So all the, everything's in the repair. And, mm. and, and, and I, and I hear that like the rebuilding of a relationship, uh, those might not have been your words, my words, but you know the, the relationship that you're creating now and the lessons that you've learned and the, the building can happen and get more and more exciting over time. I used to call BS on this with people that were married for a long time. They'd be like, the best relationship I've ever had is now. And the best hmm. sex I've ever had is now and like this stuff. And I'm yeah. like, is that something you just tell yourself to get, you know, <laughs> that, for the right, older right, right. married? But, but having now been married for 17 years and I have a 14 year old and a, and a nine year old, I, I understand the deepening of, of love and meaning mm -hmm. and really getting to know yourself and a, and a conversation I had with a buddy recently when we were in Costa Rica, um, together and he, he was like, what's the purpose of marriage? And I gave him some different answers and he goes, I think it's, for me, it's a spiritual path. Like the point of a long-term marriage is a spiritual path. And, you know, it is to, it is to bring out a spiritual uh, 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 evolution in each person. That's the purpose of a father and a child and a family. It's why the wounds can be the deepest and, and it could be the mm. most hurtful. And, you know, there's the saying, like, if you don't address your childhood trauma, your, your relationship will. <laughs> and I right. agree with all that. And, and I say that as a reflection to you that um, the, that uh, I honor your repair. I honor your uh, your engagement and your consciousness now around what you want to create. And I love that idea of making magic memories. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a, a business called M3 Adventures, and that's what it stands for: making magic memories. And in the spirit of Jim Rohn, increasing them with frequency and intensity. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, it's the relationships that are going to matter the most, and that's where you want to oh. invest. Dude, I, I was just having an, I was at an event with a guy who, um, I won't say his name, but he just sold his company last week. It was valued at uh, 3.5 billion. And he was talking about his whole mission now. And he's a young guy, he's probably 32. He hmm. was talking about how his whole mission is memories now or making magic moments. Like that was it. I should put yep. you two in contact with each other. <laughs> uh, that's his whole mission right now. And so I love that, man. I love that piece. I want to yeah. talk. Uh, um, I, I want to talk about business for a second here, and I'm going to try to tie a couple threads together. Uh, we've been on the journey of business and family. You've got this incredible book coming out, or is it out now? By the way, I meant to it's ask out. you. Yep, it's out. It is. Um, I'm very excited about that. And and I want to build a little bit of a bridge here between these two. And I don't know if you actually wrote about this in the book. But I heard you talk about it and I wanted to ask about reinventing capital structure. So what does that mean and why is that so important? Because I got the sense in an, in an interview that I watched with you that this was a big thing. Like I made note of it, I underlined it, and I wanted to bring it up to you. So what can we learn from you about reinventing capital structure? Yeah, I actually did write about it in the book. It's it's in the first chapter. And actually, if you go to the website, startupsantabook.com, uh, you can download the first chapter for free and get a sense of the flavor. So um, 
So we don't really learn from what happens. Uh, we learn from taking time to reflect on what happened mm -hmm. and unpack the the lessons from it. And you know, your there should be purpose to your pain uh, if you take the time to sit down and unpack the lessons there. Uh, and so for me, there was um, three lessons that came from that, and they were all about reinvention of things. If you're going to grow a company, what you need to be constantly thinking about to grow it and to reinvent it. Because when you grow a business, they're, everything is meant to grow, by the way. That, that's where design is humans to grow. Our businesses are supposed to grow. That's a sign of progress. That's a sign of like how we feel uh, confident and um, satisfied that we're, we're, we're advancing ourselves. Um, but at the same time, we're stressing the enterprise. When you grow it, you stress it. And depending on your rate of growth will depend on the amount of stress. So the more growth, it makes sense that you would have uh, more uh, more stress in the organization and require more reinvention. And the three things that I have identified you need to reinvent is your people, your systems, and your capital. And why I know those? Because I broke them all <laughs> and found out the hard way that if you aren't reinventing them, they will break. And it's kind of to that first story where I talked about, I grew this company um, in Canada. We were on the profit 100 list for five years in a row because of our growth, but I didn't have the right balance sheet to support that growth. So it's going to be different for different businesses because not all businesses are equal in terms of their cash constraints. Like if you're making physical goods like mine, they require that you deploy um, resources to build tooling and then you have to deploy resources to build products and then you have to deploy resources to have those products shipped and stored in warehouses, right? And then there might be some obsolescence and you know warranty stuff on the other side. All that requires a certain capital structure. If you have a SaaS company, it's different, right? You're coding and you've got people. So- Every business is going to be different, but the point being is it doesn't matter. There will be a strain on your cash depending on the model that you create. And so it's about getting ahead of that. And if you're going to grow quickly, you got to be ahead of it at a more rapid pace. And the same thing goes then with your people. You know, you're, <laughs> most entrepreneurs are really good at um, working hard and long. I used to think that was my superpower because you know, I was the hardest worker I knew. But the problem is you're not scalable. And if you want to build an enterprise to your buddy's size of 3.5 billion, that's impossible to do by yourself. You need to surround yourself with really great talent, really great people, maybe in the form of, of co-founders, business partners, uh, but most likely it's just an executive team and, and resources around them that are committed to a mission, a vision of the company, values that you behave by, and a purpose that you're driving for. And um you know, with our current enterprises, we talk about that we're missions with a company and we have a team of people that really rally around the change we're trying to create in the world. And that's important. Um, and then finally, it's just the systems to track, to inspect what you're expecting about the outcomes. Um, you know, too often, the, you know, founders are focused on also the wrong metrics. I call them vanity right, metrics, right? Um, top line's vanity, bottom line's sanity, cash flow's reality. Make sure you're inspecting the right things that will ensure your business is healthy. And so um, as a theme of reinvention, if you're going to grow an enterprise, those three things have to be a part of your annual planning at the very least. And depending on the rate of growth, should be also a part of quarterly and maybe even monthly reassessments. Wow. Uh, you know, Dan told me about, was it Greg Crabtree, Simple Numbers? Yeah. Are you a fan of that book, that work? Is that, Crab maybe that's, that's not a fair question. <laughs> I tee you up if you're not, but yeah, you know. It, it's a great book. Um, also Craig Kramer's book, CEO, CEO Toolkit. Very good also. If you're, yeah. it would be similar to that in terms of just what are the things you need to build into your business yeah. to be able to have good uh, metrics, the right yeah. metrics. What are the right metrics? Because every business is going to be different, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's something uh, for me, man, I have always said I'm such a people person. I always want to put all my energy into people and I kind of avoid the numbers piece just because it feels like I tell myself it's not my strength. It's not where I should be putting my time and attention. And at the same time, I need to have enough, enough intelligence in that space to guide the company in the way that a founder needs to, at least at this stage in our business, you know, last year we front row dads did like 1.2 million and it's still, you know, until we get to that place where I hire a CEO and put him in place or her in place or whomever that is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that to me is, um, 
you know, that's another step where I, you know, if I hire the CFO, but for now it's Craig Crabtree's company, simple numbers, and they're yep. going to do like this fractional work for us and help us with those numbers. Um, you said right. top line is vanity, bottom line is sanity and profit is reality. Cash flow is reality. Oh, cash flow is reality. <laughs> Man, and they're not so all good. the same, right? You oh, can have profits, so but if you have receivables that are long extending, that dries up yeah. cash. And at the end yeah. of the day, your cash flow is what you actually get to work with. Had you always been a numbers person? Did you have to become a numbers person over time? No. And I would even say, you know, like most CEOs, you kind of have to be good at a bunch of things, try a bunch of things, yeah. understand a bunch of things. There's probably, yeah. of course, we all have one or two things we're really good at, yeah. but you have to have a little bit of legal. You have to have a bit of finance. You have a little bit of like operations. You know, I can do all that, but I'm better at visioning. I'm better at guidance. I'm better at leadership. That is where I've focused my attention. But as a leader of an organization, you have to have awareness and some ability in each of those areas. Talk to me about the people part for a second, you know, having reevaluate, reevaluating re or reinventing your staff and your team. What did you learn about people along the way where, and you can speak into the system part of it, perhaps about like how you identified a person for the role, if that's a, a profile, you know, test as an example, how much of that was your gut of like, man, I just like this person and I hire for passion and I train for talent. You know, talk to me about your philosophy around building teams and reinventing and, and making the hard decision maybe of letting someone go, just anything that comes up for you in that space. Yeah. Well, again, this is a chapter in my book. Um, I, I reference uh, Toy Story, actually, and I talk about the characters from the movie Toy Story and how all those various characters are complementary to achieving a mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a bunch of great metaphors to pull from that. But uh, my own personal Toy Story comes from the school of hard knocks. You know, I tell people I have a, I don't have an MBA from university, but I have a PhD in DUMB from the school of hard knocks. <laughs> I got that in the States. Um, yeah. So... Uh <clears throat> there's a bunch of things. First of all, um, there's a difference between being self-employed and building an enterprise. Okay. okay. Being self-employed relies on you. If you're going to build anything scalable, sustainable, and ultimately saleable, it needs to become an enterprise. And that's only accomplished through great people, period. Um, the problem is entrepreneurs in general, and this is my experience, are not very good at actually uh, finding talent. <clears throat> Why? We, two things. Number one, we like to hire people that we like. And we see the potential in everyone because that's just what we are. We're entrepreneurs. We see the potential. <laughs> so um, my first enterprises were pretty much built on, uh, you know, the idea of hiring people like, and seeing that they, you know, even though they were projects, but you know, I could see on the other side of that project was somebody with potential. And so if I invested into them, I could save them and turn them into somebody great. And what I found is that I eventually became the leader of bozos. I had a bunch of people that were basically yes people sitting around and I was the smartest guy in the room. And that's not a very scalable way to build anything meaningful that will last. So um, when that first company went in the ground, part of my reassessment of what I needed to do and part of it came from my personal growth and personal development was that I need to just be better at hiring and building teams. And to, to this day, if, if you ask me what's the, the vital functions of a CEO, to me, I say, number one is set the vision and make sure the company has the resources to actually achieve it. Number two is go hire the talent to make it possible. And then number three, live out the values of the organization, model it for the rest of them. And so finding the talent part, um, I had to create a system that would save me from myself and uh, it came from a bunch of resources and uh, largely the school of hard knocks. But you know, what I tell you is that anybody who comes into our company, the, the, the starting point is you're not qualified until you prove you are versus you kind of go into interviews and go, oh, I hope they're qualified. Like you're looking at it from the other perspective. It's like literally you have to earn your spot on this team. So we're interviewing you and you have to prove to this interview that you could qualify to make it. Secondly, it's not just one and done. <clears throat> we have four different interviews with four different leaders in the company and everybody has a veto. If they see something they don't like, they can call them out on it and they, they can say this person is going to work. And then it's most importantly, getting past, um, most people are looking for aptitudinal qualities. Like where did they work? What was their experience like? What school they went to? That stuff is kind of table stakes. 
the real important stuff is how do you get to the inner character? How do you define what the attitude is? Mm -hmm. And those are a lot harder to get to. But, you know, Lencioni talks about you want somebody who's hungry, humble, and smart. Well, smart and hungry, you can kind of assess through interviews, but humble, that speaks to inner character. And that's a lot harder to get to, but that that's the most important and enduring quality to make sure that we see if they're a fit for what we're doing long-term. So all I can tell you is that uh, we've created a system for us. Uh, you can actually find it through um, some of the resources we've used are like Darren Hardy's business masterclass has a section yeah. on it that I would highly recommend. I think it's, it's an amazing way to uh, interview and find the right people. Um, Patrick Lencioni is the ideal team player. That book is awesome. It's in a great resource. And Brad Smart's book, Who? And we kind of took yeah. a bunch of each of those and created our own system. And it's not perfect. Even with that, we still have people that become decoys who get through and we find out it doesn't work out. But I would say our odds of finding the right people have increased massively. But if you get the right people, it's not additive. It's, it's exponential to the outcomes. And here's the key principle. If you hire the right people, they're free. Because the value that they're going to create is so much greater than what you compensate them. And, and this is something I had to learn the hard way. <laughs> I, my first enterprises, I, I, didn't, I didn't get this. By the time I got to Tech for Kids, my executive team that was sitting around the table, I could honestly say every single one of them was smarter than me at operations, mm -hmm. marketing, mm -hmm. sales, finance. And in fact, in some cases, I was paying them more than I was paying myself. Yeah. And that didn't even feel very good. By the end of the day, guess what? I own the equity in the company and the value of my company is going up. And that actually made it very uh, worthwhile. And so I felt pretty smart by just making that decision to say, I put my ego aside, go hire the best talent. Because if if I do it right, it's not additive, it's exponential and they're free. Yeah, very cool. Would the people in your life describe you as firm, fair, but fun? <laughs> Wow. You know, it's, the reason I'm saying wow to that is that I had to give my dad's eulogy two years ago. And that's exactly how I described him. Yeah. Firm, fair, but fun. And I hope that I can live up to his uh, standards. My dad was a legend in my eyes. He was my hero. And uh, yeah, I, I, I aspire to be that person for sure. That's cool. It feels that way. Feels like you're firm, fair, but fun. <laughs> I like that. I think your, I think your dad, I think your dad would uh, feel the same. Hmm. You no, know, that's cool. Um, mm, I just want to take a second, let that set for a moment. As I'm, I'm, I'm feeling into my own heart, man. My dad's alive, and I'm hmm. just feeling into like what that will be one day to not have him here. You know. Hmm. Our yeah. dads are, our, our dads are, are an interesting influence in our lives. Uh, you know, when you tell stories about your dad, what, what are some of your, like, what's one story that comes up where you're like, man, if I had to sort of pick one that articulates like who he was to me or how he made a difference to me, is there one that might come to mind about who he is, what he did, how he showed up? Yeah. Look, I think, first of all, there's all through my book, I've woven stories and sayings from my dad because I owe so much of my early childhood to my father. My dad was, he was a disciplinary, like he, he expected um, hard work. In fact, for quite a while, um, you know, the way I earned my dad's love was how hard I worked. And my, my uh, belief, right, wrong, and different was, you know, if it wasn't hard, it didn't count. I needed to do the extra hard things to really earn his love and attention. You know, that's not true, but it was the way I was raised. But he was always fun and incredibly fair. Um, but as a part of that, I, I remember uh, as I was going through some of the, the difficulties, uh, my dad would say to me, uh, Brad, don't despise the process for what it's going to make of you. This is a process. Gold is refined in fire. A diamond is a lump of coal going through incredible heat and pressure. On the other side of this adversity is a better version of yourself. And don't despise the process. It's the metamorphosis of you becoming who God intended for you to be. And I hated those words. <laughs> they were supposed to be encouraging, but it was um, it was tough, tough medicine. And um, you know, he used to say, and I actually wrote this out 
into a, a picture frame put by my 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 bed. He said, you know, Brad, in life you're gonna pay one to two prices. The price of discipline or the price of regret. The price of discipline, it weighs ounces. It's definitely gonna cost you something. But the price of regret weighs tons. It'll crush you under its weight. And I hated those words too. <laughs> it was tough mess. <laughs> but I put it into a picture frame next to my bed. So that here in Canada, when in the middle of winter, it's dark and cold and my alarm would go off early in the AM, instead of rolling over, I would look at those words and roll out. It was what I needed mm -hmm. to see and to read and reinforce that this yes. price of discipline, it kind of sucks to have to get up early and go and do the work, but it's what's required because if I don't, the price of regret is what's waiting for me down the road. And... Um, so I say all that to say my dad was just an incredible sage. I just feel so get, so privileged to have had a guy who had, you know, the the battle scars from some challenges. Grew up in a very tumultuous home. You know, he also went through a, a bankruptcy in a business. Uh, uh, you know, and and learned from that. Um, so it was it was just incredible to have that sage influence. My 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 Yoda happened to be in my home with me all this time. Very cool. I uh, <clears throat> I. Can only imagine that there's guys out there listening, dads out there listening, wondering how their kids will speak about them, you know, years from now when they're on a podcast or in an interview hmm. and somebody asks about their father. It's really interesting to think about. You said you wrote about uh, or referenced your dad a, a bunch through the book. Um, when you were writing this book, who are you writing it for? You know, who who do you hope reads this? Uh, why is this book important to you? What what impact do you hope it makes in the world? So, first of all, if you do read the book, um, you'll read the dedications to my father, um, who passed away while I was in the process of writing. Mm. And ironically, my mother passed away at the end, and so I have a tribute oh. to her at the end. So, losing both parents, kind of you know, bookending, no pun intended, Amazing. my book. Um, had massive impact. You know, I, I, I think Imagine. that, uh, um, tears are the best way your heart speaks and a, a heart that's been softened is just much more able to give more meaningful, um, words. So the book hopefully reflects that it's really meant to inspire entrepreneurs and founders. Uh, my avatar that I was focused on was my daughter who's a aspiring young entrepreneur. And I thought, what would I want to know in my mid twenties that I don't know that I didn't know then that I know now that I would want to pass on to her um, in terms of lessons of how she should expect it to be. Because, you know, there's two different ways we learn in life. One is knowledge, which is learning from your own mistakes. And one is wisdom, which is learning from the mistakes of others. If you're willing to apply the lessons yeah. and that's the key point. Um, so she's, she's the person I was thinking about and uh, look, I think this book, yeah, there's, it's informative. I think you're going to get some instruction in terms of some ideas that will be helpful. Uh, but most importantly, it's there to inspire. Yeah. Um, I want, you know, the world needs more inspiration now more than ever. seems like we're in a time of incredible tumult and uncertainty and ambiguity. And uh, I think that it comes back to how does one individual yourself be empowered in a way that can impact your world that's around you, but ultimately is the, the the beginning steps of impacting the world at large, right? I think Mother Teresa said, if everybody swept up their own doorstep, the world would be a cleaner place. So why not you? Yeah. Why not now? And let's start with, with getting you inspired and encouraged for creating a better version of yourself that creates a better world at large. Brad, I want to ask you a couple final questions here. <clears throat> um, and what I'm looking for is your gut reaction to something. The challenge is in as few words as possible. And let's call it an aim for 90 seconds or less. So okay. unpack it to what you want. The aim is 90 seconds or less. And it's and I'm going to ask you just a couple of really simple questions. And I'm just looking for your gut reaction. So unplanned, we didn't script this, just here, you know, and you the topics will be obvious when I start asking it. Okay, so we'll just call this best advice. Um, and it's something you might have already said. So that's fine too. You can repackage it in a shorter way if you want. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Best advice on fatherhood. Um, 
live your life. I, uh, this is something that I have learned. And so live stands for L stands for love unconditionally, by the way, that doesn't mean uh, unconditional approval. I think there are points that real love shows up saying, Hey, I don't approve of this action, but I unconditionally love you. I stands for inspire, uh, live your life in a way that inspires your family. Uh, the most damaging thing for your kids is the unlived life of their parents. So live in an aspiration way. V is vulnerability. Show up and be human. Stop trying to answer it all, know it all, show it all. Be a person who they can connect with. And E is experiences. Create magic memories with your family. Make them more meaningful every time you can. And on the other side of that is let your kids live their experiences. Don't be a snowplow parent. Beautifully said. All right. Best wisdom you have on marriage. Ah, it is a work in progress continually. It's not one and done, uh, which you appreciate, appreciates. So you need to invest the time, do the work consistently. My wife and I have two rituals weekly. Every Wednesday, we have a date night. It's just meant to be fun. She plans one. I plan the other. It's kind of a surprise to the other person. That just kind of keeps the, the joy in the journey. And the second is we have a Sunday morning check-in where we go through and we do a self-assessment of how we showed up as a father, husband, lover, and provider. And of course, hers is uh, instead of a husband, it's a wife. And we self-assess and then we give each other feedback. But it keeps the relationship nimble because it happens through communication. And that's something that's been a huge uh, help for our marriage. Agreed. Uh, third would be best advice on health. Invest in it. <laughs> I think, you know, it is, it's, and it's holistic, right? I think it was Will Smith's when asked, uh, what do you do to uh, get in shape? He said, it's, it's easier to stay in shape. So get health, maintain it. It's the one resource that you are in charge of, uh, ensuring that you do the best to provide it. This is a temple you are supposed to, uh, provide the mental, emotional, physical sustenance for it to thrive, not just, not just to, to exist. Yeah. And I love what you said earlier about even in the difficult time of your business, you were, you were going to the gym, you were taking care of yourself. And I really respect that. I had a buddy one time and he said, when my business is, you know, having a difficult time, I'm going to the gym uh, once a day, but if my business is having a really difficult time, I make it twice a day, <laughs> <laughs> which seems just the opposite of what most would do. They're like, I got to bag the gym so I can focus on the business. And I have never seen that strategy work out long-term. There's, there's one other I'd add to it is that when you're going through the challenges like that, it's hard to feel motivated to go to a gym. The thing I've learned is that feelings are something that are a byproduct of what you do. So, you know, I don't love going to the gym, by the way, I don't look forward to it, but on the other side of it, I always feel great about it, right? Like it's just, it's amazing. So you can manipulate your feelings by your actions, feelings precede your action. And going to the gym is just one way to get yourself out of a funk. This is why you do it. When you're feeling bad, you're feeling overwhelmed. You go to the gym. It's the one piece you can control and you feel like you accomplished something. The last one here is, and I know you wrote a whole book on this. Uh, th there's, there's 10 ideas you explore in the book. So maybe you could just pick one here and maybe you've already talked about it. Cause we had talked about some pretty cool things about business, but best advice on business. Ah, uh, best business advice. I look, I think a business requires four elements and a fifth that surrounds it all. And that is, you need an, a, a founder with an idea, Right. Secondly, you need an idea that is different, not better. And there's some delineation I talk about in the book. If you have a, be a better idea, you've already given the market share to somebody else as the predominant. If it's different, it's a new category you can create. Third, you need a team of people to surround you, which you already kind of talked about. But more importantly, the team of people, number four, you need execution, right? So like when the US basketball team went to the Olympics in 2000, was it 2004, I think, that they lost to Lithuania best players in the world, but they couldn't execute together. So you have to have that execution. Those four elements are required to actually build a meaningful enterprise. And the fifth overarching all of it is luck. And luck is nothing more than timing. Right idea at the right time is what connects. Um, the right idea at the wrong time is still the wrong idea. And I tell some stories in the book about people who came up with ideas just a little too soon or maybe too late. It's about timing it, timing it right. And um if you can get those five things together, you can create a very meaningful enterprise 
but it, it, it's not just, again, there's a difference between being self-employed and building an enterprise to build an enterprise. I truly believe those are the five critical elements required to make it work. Brad, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for doing the work uh, all these years, man. Thanks for, uh, you know, when you get knocked down, you you got back up and now you've got some stories to tell and some wisdom to share. And so we don't have to just acquire knowledge. We can have true wisdom, like as you said. Uh, thank you for showing up for your family. Thanks for uh, being, creating magic moments with your now adult children. Thanks for your commitment to your marriage. Thanks for taking time today to talk with me and share your life with the Front Row Dad community. Um, you are, in my mind, uh, an avatar of a Front Row Dad. You know, you're somebody who's passionate about business, uh, and yet you understand the value of family. And you said it right before, I think before we started recording that when you looked at the website, you were drawn to family men with businesses, not businessmen with families. And I think it's safe to say that we've all been businessmen with families. And that's why we're drawn to the phrase family yeah. first. And so thank you, brother, for um, just sharing your hero's journey with me. Uh, I hope there's another opportunity for us to to spend more time together. This was really enjoyable, meaningful, and thank you. John, thank you for having me and entrusting me with your community. Um, I so appreciate that you've had the courage to actually lean into this very important idea around how do we put family first. And uh, I applaud you on uh, taking the initiative. And obviously, you're doing important work that's really, uh, at this point in our lives, very, uh, very critical that people feel how they can be family first in their focus. So I love it. Thank you, brother. All right, guys, uh, fellas, thanks for listening. Uh, go pick up a, a Lomi, go get some Pella products. <laughs> uh, go pick up a copy of Startup Santa, a toy maker's tale of 10 business lessons learned from timeless toys. Uh, get a couple copies, share one with a friend, leave a review. I know Brad would appreciate that. Um, that's it, gentlemen. All right, talk to you next time.